Hi, everybody. Um, hi, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Paulina and I will be your MC for the next hour or so. Today's discussion is about discovery of context from mobile or sorry, from web to mobile presented by number eight. Now, for those of you on the call who may not be uh, familiar with number eight, it is a technology company that works with content providers to deliver personalized experiences across mobile platforms. So that is just my quick sum up, but I'm sure our guests will be able to elaborate more on that. Um, just a quick intro here. Today, more often than not, our physical environment is more diverse than our online world, as I'm sure everybody on this line can, can relate. We play the same game, listen to the same music, and read the same news while traveling, relaxing at home, waiting in that lineup at the grocery store, or even commuting. Um, this is the discovery of Mobex, which our guests will walk us through um, throughout their conversation this afternoon. Very, very exciting. Our speakers are Abhishek Sen, CEO and co-founder of Number 8, as well as Emma Raz, Director of Commercial of Number 8. Now, as I open up the floor for our guests, I just wanted to highlight that not only is this today's topic is very exciting, at least for me, um, uh, today's discussion, but obviously this is so relevant to everybody, um, not only here today, uh, but also across the globe as well. Now, what I found interesting, but certainly not surprise, surprising, and I feel like these numbers may be even higher, but as I was reading through some stats this morning, um, Canada is one of the most, what I'll call, mobile-friendly countries um, when it comes to communication. In certain age groups, um, almost everybody can have a smartphone, and many don't even use a landline service anymore. Um, and to that point, roughly 86% of all Canadian households, or probably even more at this point, um, have at least one smartphone. Anyway, um, our audience didn't come here today to listen to me, but rather to our guests and experts in the field. So before um, I uh, let you take over, just a couple of quick um, housekeeping items. Uh, First of all, while all of our attendees are on mute, everybody's more than welcome to post their questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of Zoom and time permitting, we will get to them at the end of our, um, at the end of this conversation. Without further ado, I'm gonna stop talking now. Welcome Abby and Emma, please take it away. Thank you so much, Paulina. Um, to, um, well, great to be here and thank you for joining us. Um, as Polina said, I'm Emma Raz and Abby. Yes, uh, see of number eight, very excited to be here because as Polina mentioned, this is a very relevant and pertinent topic right now as we are talking about contextual targeting, ID list, privacy, cook, there's a whole range of things. And so hopefully we can shed some light into what we see as context and how its definition is different from the web world and how it's evolving into the mobile in-app space. So very curious, yeah, very excited to have this conversation. AKA Morbex, you'll hear this term a lot in this session um, and you'll become an expert by the end of it. Of all things Morbex, um, I can't wait. And to kick us off in number eight tradition, we're gonna start with a pop quiz. Mm -hmm. um, Abby, how about you? Yes, um, uh, ask you know, question? given that uh, given that Canada has been, you know, from uh, if you think of the smartphone era, you know, BlackBerry was home to for a lot of people. You know, I'm sure a lot of people had the 6820s and 68Ks and all that. So, so in the world of mobile communications, what does GPR stand for? These four options. Uh, you have 15 seconds to answer, and there's going to be three prizes for the first top three uh, answers. Please put your answers in the chat and I'll play a 15 second clip so you can feel like it's a Jeopardy show. So here we go. The first three correct answers will win a prize for us. I'll just uh, like. <laughs> All right, that's good. Hopefully you got some answers in. Cool. Um, Yes, well, hopefully we'll get to give you a reward um, or 
Oh, yeah. um, so oh, all um, finger important. crossed in the end of it, and we'll tell you the correct answer, or Abby will tell you the correct answer because I don't know myself. Um, but let's kick us off. Okay. Yes, and we can now start the discovery of context, or AKA known by uh, like known as Mobex, from web to mobile. Um, in this conversation, we're going to talk about um, why we talk about like why are we talking about this right now? Why is this topic important for the immediate future? The origin story of context, where does context come from? We'll dive into Mobex. I did say we're going to talk about Mobex a lot. Um, how can Mobex be used? And finally, takeaways. And of course, finally, finally, your um, we'll try to answer any questions you have. So please, please feel free, sorry, to add them in the Q&A. And um, Abby, why are we talking about this right now? Well, you know, we've had so many conversations with all sides of the ecosystem. We've talked from agencies to buy side, sell side, publishers, and context is becoming very relevant right now for a whole range of reasons. I mean, if you actually break it down, we can say a lot of things can stem from the, from the privacy changes that have been introduced uh, recently. Well, it's not really that recent anymore. It's been last year um, from the announcement of Apple. And that's driving forth a lot of the conversations around MobX and the ID changes that is being brought forth for users. There's a lot of changes in the ecosystem and consumer awareness of privacy as a whole. And in terms of, you know, how is your data used? What's possible? The concept of identities. So that's another reason. And lastly, I'd say, you know, mobile proliferation, I think Melina mentioned in Canada is about 86%. I'm pretty sure you can go into most countries right now, the smartphone penetration is pretty darn high. So, I mean, people use mobile devices very differently than a desktop or a laptop. It is literally in our pockets, on us, in our pockets, in our backpack, anywhere we go. We're engaging with video to audio, to games, to news, to... Sometimes I've seen people on the tube just <laughs> unlocking and locking the screen and <laughs> that's all they do, but it's still on the mobile device, you know? So uh, there's a lot of things that are happening in the ecosystem that points us to saying, all right, what is this idea of MobX? And what does it actually mean? So MobX to, yeah, go ahead, Emma. No, I mean, I'm just thinking that you touched about two, like two very interesting points here. There is one, the rise of reintroduction of why context is important, um, whether context or MobX, due to the changes in privacy regulations or privacy expectations from the users themselves. So the need to um, address the audiences without knowing who they are and without having their ideas in the first place. Um, why, and that's why the concept of contextual targeting has been revisited by the industry as it's, already, like it's been there for years. And then secondly, the rise of mobile in general. Um, as mobile become more prevalent in our daily life, um, obviously, or it's almost natural that the type of usage or the context will also evolve. So um, from something that was developed more on the web platform to something which is more mobile or like oriented or um, mobile friendly, um, which is Mobex in the first place. So I think those are two really important um, questions. I think I would also maybe, oh, two different, like two very important notes. Maybe I would also add to that, um, the challenges or the, not challenges, or maybe the opportunity that it presents. So there has been, and we've been tending as an industry to often use um, a lot of details and personal information for um, optimization or targeting and personalization. So we needed to know a whole range about the user um, to personalize anything. The really interesting part is that often us as users, for example, if you look at me as a person, I'm, a, well, for one, I'm a vegan, I'm a pet owner, I'm a walker, I'm a whole range of things. However, more often than not, I'm not going to, even though I'm all these things, socialite, a luxury buyer, everything, I'm not always going to be engaging with all of the content in every context. Often different content will be more relevant to, my, to myself in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And it's also understanding that you, of course, need to know the person and what they care about in general, but also the understanding of what they care or need at that particular moment. 
and how effective that can be. Um, that is also representing another opportunity um, of revisiting what we know about personalization. Yeah, context. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's used to be, you know, back in the days, we content is king. And you can say there's a lot of marketing slogans saying context is king all of a sudden because it's that idea of grabbing people's attention because our attention span has become shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, even though we have a lot of choice. So understanding what is most relevant for the user at this point in time, be it content and ads obviously fall in the content piece as well. How do we get to that? Well, understand what is the user actually doing, which is the context of the, of the individual. So yeah. So I think that, like I said, like it's not, it's not because like we have a very short attention plan, not despite that we have a lot of choices, because we have a lot of choice. Yeah. And the more choice we have, the shorter our attention Yeah, because you only have 24 hours in a day. It's not like it's become 36 hours in a day all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware. I was like thinking the more like when I got to my last birthday, like when I get older, maybe I'll get some like hours back. I don't know, get some discount with age. Unfortunately, they're refusing. The world is refusing to give me more hours. Um, so I have to be stuck with 24 hours. Um, I think that that kind of leads us also to the origin story. Um, I think that you know it, like, how about you kick us off with the origin story? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we looked at context and then you looked at web computing, you know, how we started going on this computing path, how users start using their laptop, well, first of mainframes to desktops to mini wave of HP packs or, or the Palm Pilots and then smartphones. It had this wave of web and the 90s and the early 2000s was really the web era. So a lot of things about how we engage was around the content on the web. So it just makes sense that the idea of understanding what is the user doing on the internet was around, okay, what are they reading? Which sites are they visiting? That idea of context in a mobile environment only came a lot later when smartphones, I would say, gained you know, mass adoption. Popularity, yeah. So it just makes sense. You know, anytime you think of the word context in a web environment, the immediate association is, all right, which page am I on? Oh, what's the topic? Is it a sports? Is it a football match? Is it a soccer match? Is it a cricket match or whatever? So it makes sense. But it's important to understand that word context equals content doesn't make sense in a mobile environment, in an in-app environment specifically, because you know it's in, there is a web page. You have a mobile web, but in an in-app environment, you have apps, you play games, you listen to music, uh, you read the news. So that I think that's kind of like the. I mean, I think it's like what Paulina kind of mentioned is the richness of the environment. Um, so I remember our first computer. Um, I was really young. Um, it was a computer that my um, my grandparents bought from my mom because she was doing her degree in math and computer science. So it was one of the first computers. It was very old. The first person, not that old, but yeah, it was an old computer. It was really heavy um, and it's not, it was not going anywhere. Um, so obviously a lot of what you're doing on the computer, you're in your house. You are not going with it anywhere. Um, it's not like your environment is gonna change. You are consuming different content. You are doing different things on the computer, but the computer and the physical environment were static. Um, so the richness of the environment was much richer in the virtual world in the computer than the physical world, which is obviously static. And I think when the introduction of mobile and the smaller and lighter the, like the devices are, um, this is not a great example, it's light, but not that small. Um, but the smaller or more mobile it is, the more we can take it everywhere. Um, and we will listen to, well, yeah, we were you know, and that, about the other day of how, yeah. when do you listen to podcasts? Well, when do you listen? So you, you, I will listen to it when I'm walking my dog. You will listen to it in the morning, in your morning rituals. I, as a bedtime story. Um, and all of that is like the different environment um, that we engage with the content. So the content in its essence stays the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if you see, again, the driving factors were also the advancements in mobile communications as well. You know, once... 2G, 3G, and then 4G and LT and now 5G, these can, what it does is it introduces even further and further or more advanced and gives people the chance to actually use, you know, the word mobile means mobile communications when we are 
mobile when we are moving around. So, and that's where you had a lot of things. You can think of a lot of driving factor. One is the computing wave. You had the mobile communication wave. These drive people to have access to the internet in different ways and access richer and richer experiences without having to sit behind the laptop at all times. So that understanding of context, what is the user doing? And how can we give them value at that moment is very different. So, yeah. Um, which is the origin of Mobix. So the origin yeah. of Mobix and maybe like clarifying what Mobix kind of means. Mobix is basically mobile context. It's quite simple, it's quite direct. The reason why it requires a separate term is that confusion of context and content being synonyms. Um, and because that is the perception of content being context. And I remember the other day when I was talking about context with one of our partners in Japan, they were like, oh, but how does your product, product work in Japanese? I'm like, it, it's fine. <laughs> I don't need, it doesn't really it doesn't matter. matter if it's in Japanese. Because it's, yeah, it's not it's a convenient. web page per se, of course. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be, yeah. it supports any language because there's no language involved there. Um, mm -hmm. So the idea of how you move away or what is a different type of context than therefore MobX um, and how it came into being and that idea of moving in different environmental elements is super You know what's interesting is that if you look at, we'll touch briefly on the audio side of things. In the world yeah. of audio, given the consumption patterns you were talking about, you know, how people engage with audio differently throughout the day. Wake up in the morning, listen to radio. Then you're on the drive, you listen to news. Maybe at work, you listen to music, podcasts, so on and so forth. The consumption habit and mobility is baked into the experience. So if you look how audio, Look at contextual targeting. I look at def uh, they define contextual targeting. They already understand because the content lends itself already to this mobile pattern. But if you look anywhere outside the world of audio, contextual targeting is like, wait, what is context in mobile environment? So it's very interesting to see how those two worlds, even though audio is quite unique in its own way, but the world of mobile and context as a whole, it is still you know there's so much confusion right now what is contextual targeting in mobile environment or is that even a thing so i think that i think that's yeah. especially prevalent in radio so when we're talking about audio <laughs> we're talking because you have a morning show you have like you're yeah, on the go so a lot yeah, of had, uh, it, yeah absolutely if you think of <laughs> the day part targeting for radio it's been there from the 1930s all right you know eight o'clock today morning you're gonna have this and seven o'clock is this and evening six o'clock it's been there for the longest time absolutely there's so many things we can learn from an hour this is what context means when you listen to content or engaging with content throughout the day that is actually even true to the tv if you think about it because you have your mode like your morning shows your weekend um your late night yeah. your like all of those like your morning like sunday cartoons all of those are concepts that exist why? Because we want different content or we want different things based on what we're actually doing in our external environment. If we're on a rush on a weekday, we're probably not going to spend loads of time watching TV. Unlike Sunday morning when we get to be a bit lazy and kids are at home from school. So all of that is kind of lends itself and it's the same way of thinking. While the technology kind of evolves and what we can do might differ, and what we can know might differ, the logic is very much within the same like direction or the same pattern. I don't know if like if I open something that you can see the screen, I was just trying to see Q&A. We will go into that later. I don't know if I will share my screen if I'm trying to see something, probably. Mm -hmm. So I apologize for that. Um, so do you want to just more, dig into so, more like, bit? Yeah. Let's dig into Marbex. Yeah, let's dig into Marbex. Yeah, uh, because we've, you know, again, we've spoken with buy side, tell side publishers, understanding, you know, again, what we've seen is that uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's quite a few parallel trends happening in the world of mobile. So you have a push towards edge computing, you have on-device mm -hmm. learning happening. And you can see the largest device manufacturers themselves are pushing toward, you know, you'll confuse you one of Apple's and Google's, even Amazon's, I think, uh, recent announcements for products on device, edge computing. It's been hit over and over again. So there's a definite trend and trend and wave of computing where we're seeing that 
you don't have to rely on cloud centers. These are the these are massive you know, data warehouses to do any computing or to do all the computing. Uh, devices on our wrists, so from Fitbits to smartphones, they have a lot of computing power, and that's where you have used the power of decentralization to leverage what's in your hand right now. That's one wave, and then the consumer demand for more, more privacy. personalization. First, personalization and privacy, right? Yeah, because exactly. Exactly. So, edge computing on one side, personalization is like, listen, we want more relevant stuff, but we also want it to be private. So we want it to be balanced, right? We want to give for yeah, what yeah. we get. We don't want to like sell our souls and all of our private information and know my pet, like no. my, I uh, know my grandmother's maiden name um, for you to give me a relevant ad. We just want yeah. like, yeah. I'm, I'm running right now. Give me relevant, like give me something relevant. Um, yeah. I think that is kind of the situation. And that's where we're really looking into Mobix is how to use that technology and that shift within um, towards edge computing, towards localization of computing and digitalization, and how that can feed into what we can know about the person and how much we need to really know about the, them as a person rather than the device itself. Yeah, and because the trend, as you I think mentioned earlier, well, you know, that trend from the longest, again, you see these things go in you know, they go hand in hand, yeah? There was a big push on cloud computing, big data in the, you know, 2000s and even 2010s on. So you have big data, cloud computing, and everyone's like, oh, well, let's just collect a whole bunch of data. We don't know what we're gonna do with it. Maybe it'll be useful. Maybe we're useful to deliver something relevant. But most of it is just, yeah, exactly. It's that fingers crossed, hopefully something relevant, but it's sitting there in some, maybe in some old warehouse, who knows, God knows where the data server is. But now this wave, again is computing small data. Yeah. small data small relevant data not just everything that you can which was a transition right over time because if we're looking oh, yeah, i remember when over the past 10 years like when i was learning about all these topics um the whole first collect as much as possible and like well if you collect too much and you have no idea what to do with it you also get nothing in return and you do nothing because it's almost like um, a paralysis, like what? Like yeah. I have so much data. What do I do with it now? The um, analysis paralysis thing. You have insights exactly. hell or data hell. I don't know what to even look at. <laughs> exactly. There is yeah. so much here. What do I do with it, or what is actually relevant? Um, and it's just massive, massive data, and it's completely useless. Um, and there is that, like, yes, I want to know this, and I want to know that, and I want to know that, and I don't even ask, gonna ask myself, why do I wanna know that? And what am I gonna do with this information? And how am because I gonna- push, Yeah, because the tendency has been, oh, we'll figure it out later because the cloud can support unlimited storage. <laughs> I mean, it's like oh, um, a machine, there's gonna be an algorithm. Yeah, we'll somehow magically it it's gonna spit out something useful. And, but as consumers, we're quite unaware of what's actually happening under the hood. So, so much data is just siphoned off without actually any consideration of thinking there's a data efficacy and you know almost like being responsible with every consumer's data what is going on what's leaving the device is it personally be is it personally identifiable back to the individual or not and that has been an afterthought Definitely. absolutely and i think that some of the issues or when we're starting to see and we might see more and more as we progress is a lot of the solution has been, just been ask people to consent, um, which is, has been, it's both a positive, it's both about, like there is a very positive thought behind it. It's a very good thing that we are starting to consider of informing users of what we're doing with our data and informing with data that we're collecting. However, it's been like a band-aid solution for everything. And it means that as users, we're constantly asked to give your consent to this, this give your consent to that everywhere we go the point that we no longer read what we're giving consent to, because we can't, we can't process Yeah, you have the consent blindness if you think of it. It's exactly, right. you just click yes, no, whatever, just leave me alone. Um, and yeah. if it won't let you say no, you just click yes, so it will just go away. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah. And that is like, there was a great sentence I've heard recently from one of our, actually one of our advisors, really good. He said, technology got us into this, technology should get us out. Um, so it's yeah. not just about having um, more legalization 
in one way of just like, oh, just ask consent, be more transparent, ask for more consent. It's like, okay, at some point, you know what? We're all consented out. We have no idea what we're doing anymore. Um, it's more like, how do we change the technology to be more private by default? Mm -hmm. And what kind of yeah. data and can it, we I think it's, that, it's sometimes it's that mindset shift. Of, all right, instead of saying, I want to get everything, just asking, all right, what am I trying to do over here exactly? It said, you know, what am I trying to achieve instead of just give me more data and then I'll figure it out. And that, I mean, you know, if you take it back to MobX and mobile context, context has always been an afterthought for a lot of marketing. It, it, it has. Yeah. It's about scale. Okay, how many people can I reach? But listen, it's the same individual. If they're receiving the same message, in very different moments, guess what? They can respond very differently. Completely. And that so is the brain. On audience scale is a very uh, misleading way of running campaigns and running, uh, yeah, of running campaigns or even delivering content. I think that that's where performance sometimes have the advantage in the terms of like understanding, like it is converted, not convert. Why? Because the point is conversion. It's not necessarily just seeing as many eyeballs as possible. And I think that that's why also we saw the rise in attention, right? Um, so if we're looking at what people used to say, oh, it takes people need to see your name seven times before they remember. Mm -hmm. It's now around 40 and it's growing. Why? Because they're automatically blind to it. It's like literally there is a banner blindness. There is an ad blindness. There is a whole all blindness. Why? Because our brain is naturally physically programmed to block any information that is irrelevant for us in a given point. So we are developed physiology, like biologically to ignore this information if we don't need it. It means that if you hit me with food, if I'm really not hungry and I can't eat right now, I will not notice it. Hit me when I'm starving, I will I mean, that's, see all that's over it. True. If you, I mean, I don't know if this example makes full sense, but I'll say it. You know, when you're hungry, and you go to the, a grocery store, and you end up buy buying a lot. lot. Yeah. <laughs> and so it happens all the time. But make sure you eat something and then go to the grocery store. Guess what? You're not going to be making uh, all I sorts have the of opposite. Why, why like, I look at the this shopping time. list. I'm not hungry. I'm like, no, I don't need exactly. to buy. Like, exactly. The groceries arrive. I have nothing to eat. <laughs> Let me just <laughs> But buy. yes, that is exactly the concept. Exactly. Is that your point. needs in that moment really influence what you'll notice, what you'll do, how you'll act um yeah same definitely. with everything else so if um i just broke literally just went to a run came back from a run or broke the shoe um or just experienced that like the ability me noticing an ad about that product is a lot more relevant or i'm just coming back from it i just came back from a trip i will also notice something regarding that experience mm -hmm. because it was just much more relevant to what i've done and what's very powerful with mob mobx is that it's not reliant on information that people say they do. That's what they're doing. Very important because a lot of data, if you think about any data, DMP data or anything that is used typically for third parties, God knows where that data is coming from. Which <laughs> panel that's being used, which, uh, which third party data services and some surveys people took, who knows? And we don't even know how stale that data is. How valid is that anymore? And even if we did, even if we know it's we from last week and it's from this panel and it's the very reputable and it did an amazing, like an amazing job at doing the survey. And this used to be my job, um, just <laughs> so I'm just referring. This used to be my job. And one of the main problems I was facing is the bias between behavior and what people say they do. And especially as I was working in a nonprofit, um, there is a great bias, like I'll tell you out front, there's a great bias between what people say and like say what they do will do and what they actually will do. Would you want to donate? Of course. Will you actually do it? No. Um, and that is about, like that is examples of how we behave every day. That is a normal thing. And it's a known bias within research. So looking at behavior, and observing is usually much more powerful than just a survey um, because you can't account for what's the gap. It's very hard to quantify it. Yep. yep. So examples, my favorite part. Yeah, Should we yeah. dive into, like, do you want to go to examples or were you? 
No, go for it. Because, you know, we, as we talk about examples, I mean, it can be used to deliver the, the most relevant message. It can exactly. be used to understand. I mean, you know, if you have that marketing term of right audience, right message at the right time, the right time is always ignored. It's all right, let's get the right message, hopefully, for the right audience, hopefully. And the right time is like, well, they should be ready at all times, but no, that's not the case. <laughs> Good to go. Are you not good to go now? Um, yeah. So it's uh, yeah. Well, that's very valid, and I think that that's a very that's a very good term. So like, and also like, so like, well, let's unpack a bit what is the right message, um, and in the right like to the right audience at the right time. Yeah. Um. So the right message is also something that is very very uh, like not often ignored, but if we see a campaign, and I often see it in like again working in ad tech for a very long mm. time. You would get a um, a kit or a pack of creatives, and they're all other like you can get static, some video, some of the lower quality, higher quality, but there's not going to be a lot of consideration of who's the actual audience for it. Um, we're just trying to target users to either download or to play with it. Um, and the same for if you look at other services or other brands. However, for example, if you try to sell a person like me a, deter a laundry detergent and you show me um someone coming from x from the gym trying to do a lot of laundry i never go to the gym i'm not going to respond to it i'm not going to remember it i'm not going to notice it it's like nah i don't need it show me a dog jumping all over you and loads of hair all over I'm like yeah that's me that's my life um that entire thing of like customization for the right audience is also within ads also really relevant. So everything that we do is meaning, how do we tailor that message to resonate? How do we tailor that message to speak to that, to their experience um, mm -hmm. is also really important. And you can have and, very similar creatives yeah. that yeah. behaves quite similarly, but just minor changes that really impact performance. Yeah. And the I think the, the like one of the important things as we've touched on is there's a difference in web and a difference in mobile in yeah. terms of context. It's a big, yeah, because on the web page, again, it's it's a content that you see on the, on the page itself. That's where the diversity is. And maybe the URL type and the semantic meaning. In a mobile environment, it literally is, what am I doing right now while engaging with whatever app and that I'm, you know, using? So that it kind of brings us. So there is the one, like there's the two things that. So like one, there is the actual audience, and mm -hmm. whether obviously on mobile, sometimes we'll know who's the audience a bit different. So like their behavior in general, um, yeah. or their likes and dislikes. And then there is what they're actually doing right now. And let's go back to the same example. It's very likely that if I, um, same like still a pet owner, still um, still trying to buy detergent. Um, if you want to target a person with a gym ad, maybe contact, like maybe show it when they come back from the gym or at the gym, because yeah. they're going to be yeah. thinking about Absolutely. it. Um, and they just need to do the laundry and they're just all sweaty and disgusting. And yeah, me, we, probably yeah. target me when I come back from a walk, um, because I've been playing with yep. dogs, all the dogs that I meet on my walk, and I'm full of like little scratches. You know, this is exactly what I think, like one of the campaigns we were talking with one of the agencies, they said, yeah, we want to basically reach people after they finish a specific exercise, not in the moment, but after, because that's the most, that's when users are most receptive to that message. Exactly. And that can be an exercise, that can be a walk with your dog, yeah. that can be, um, yeah. so if I'm walking and I own a dog, like the combination, that can be during my morning rituals um, and so on and so forth. Those are all different moments that I will care about different things. Um, if you're trying to sell me coffee, by the way, hit me in the morning. I drink like two cups of coffee as soon as I wake up. Um, if there's any other, if there's any coffee company listening, I'm, I'm your customer. Yeah, and I think, uh, well, we talked about privacy and yeah. privacy. How does Mobix play a role in this? Well, this element of not giving up one's identity is almost baked into Mobix and edge computing and all of these things almost come together in context in a, in a mobile environment because you know what has happened and with iOS changes and pretty soon on Android, you'll have a similar kind of thing 
but it's not the same, but it's like a watered down version of privacy changes on Android. It's is iOS that four of, years ago. Yeah, it's yeah three, four years ago. That element of an identifier has been, you know, ha has come under threat. Like, or not under threat, I mean, you have, you know, a majority of the ad requests for mobile ads going out right now are without identifiers. So that basic premise or that reliance on identifiers has been challenged. And that's where we see that I'd say Mobix is a very powerful opportunity to actually tap into users' device, uh, you know, users' own you know, uh, experiences to give them something relevant without having to know, all right, Nike needs to know Emma is Emma. And then only then, if and only then that I know this is Emma, that I can deliver something like walking shoes to Emma. I think that that's actually a very, very good point because that actually leads us to the idea of why, for example, we were created in the first place and another, like an, a major use case. It's not just about which ads deliver, that can be expanded to any content. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the use cases that we've been looking at into what ads like to deliver the right ads at the right time and the, to the right people. However, when we talk about content or message, that can also be the right product recommendation. That can also be the right content, the right song. Um, that can be the right article or or the right experience, meaning from a UX perspective, how to get like give the right um, controllers, um, the length of the session, or like if we're looking at, for example, games, you might want to give a shorter game or shorter content when people are less engaged and we're going to play for a shorter period of time because they're waiting in line. Everything there. Um, that world of why context is important, why MobX is important, and how you can use it is much greater than the right ad. Obviously, the right ad is very important and something that we're in this industry dealing with right now. But a lot of the app owners, a lot of publishers will require this information because a lot of their own databases of what to show, what to give people, was also based on the same ID. Um, and their ha like the ability to know and their knowledge of their users is quite limited. So how do you enrich that first party data? What is a, what is good and valuable first party data? Is it always demographic? Is it only demographics? Is demographics the only valuable information we can know? And what is the different value in knowing that? Because you can know certain things from demographic, you can assume certain things, but a lot of the things. And for example, a lot of the problems that we've seen in advertising was from a like deduction from demographic and the assumption that demographics will tell you everything about a user. Yep. Should I put like should I move yeah. aside? I'm gonna ask you, like yeah, let's go you wanna to go to the next one? Yeah, go to the next slide. I think we had one slide on. I'm trying. Um yeah, one slide, one slide of companies and the ecosystem. And the reason why we wanted to kind of show this is to kind of give a taste of, in the advertising world, which companies are using or will use or will be impacted and have a value from MobX and why. Um, and that started with like, it comes from um, one side of the far left of the more dynamic ads, especially on audio and how dynamic ads are shaped using MobX, all the way to more SSP side, DSP side ad networks and how the targeting and um, the current digital marketing world is being reimagined um, with a lot of in between from the audio to get to audio and gaming to in play and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to see. I mean, this is the first time we're seeing different industries just overlapping. Now you have audio going into gaming and then it's very interesting to see how those two, and also then there's advertising and then there's content in there as well. So, and context is of course, uh, Mobix in these cases, I looked at very different angles, but to achieve the same thing, serve the most relevant content to the most relevant user in the most receptive, you know, when they're most receptive. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, the goal is always the same. It's just like yeah. what exactly that content is going to look like. What is exactly the KPI? But even even the KPI is quite similar. Like in the end, you want to see engagement, whether it's yeah. a clicking on an ad or remembering the ad or um, purchasing something. You want to see some sort of an like acknowledgement, attention, and an engagement with it in some way. Um, 
So whether it's an ad or it's not an ad. It's especially hard today and more difficult today. You know, if you look at the time spent on mobile, it's about three and a half, four hours a day yeah. that spent on all that devices. The desktop uses about two, two and a half hours-ish. So mobile uses is, is through the roof. So that means we have, we're spending more time. You have more stuff to spend the time on. So receptivity is very important to know, okay, when am I most receptive to that specific message? So. And the fact that we are consuming so much, like so much content yeah. and so much content in general, whether yeah. it's ads, whether it's any content, we're just consuming a ridiculous and unprecedented amount of content. Um, mm -hmm. And I remember having this conversation with my grandmother um, a few years back and she was like, your generation always gets really tired. And it's like, because we need to compute so much information in such a short time. We're just tired, more tired. <laughs> um, trying to excuse why our generation is not lazy. I refuse to acknowledge it. We're not lazy. We're just very busy in our head. <laughs> so we just have to consume so much information. It, it is actually quite tiring. Um, just constantly, even just constantly scrolling through socials is exhausting because imagine how much you're actually reading through, even if it's just keywords, and how much your brain needs to tell you relevant, re not relevant, relevant, not relevant. It's in it's At that moment. Yep. Yep. Um, so definitely com the competition is fierce um, and trying to get that attention and trying to get like, just get that message across and making sure that it's memorable um, mm -hmm. is very, very difficult. Um, and that's why, for example, a million ads are a very interesting product. I'm going to zone into that because they did some research around it as well. What they do is using MobX, actually. In fact, MobX, um, information regarding the weather, the location of the device, and so on, to really tailor the message to the user um, to see how much it, like, if it performs better. And the product and the company are still the same, but even just the changes yep. of getting it right grabbing their attention because it's like it's really within their context is very very effective now imagine that you also tailor it in what they need it the most that you also know what they need even more who they are you can from an ad serving perspective it's essentially then matching which one will perform the best in given that the user in this is in this context right now absolutely it's the, it's the exact same thing from the creative matching to which ad to actually show right now this one or this one one is geared towards something else so and or, even, both, yeah. or even from the point of don't show an ad right now because they or don't bid on it right now because guess what you're probably not going to engage with it or they're not going to remember it so there's yeah. two things like that can actually be something for a brand and for yeah. performance because often that's very visual in performance because you see oh people did not install or did not take an action they did not order the meal um, so something like food delivery, because that is what you're like, they didn't like order the first, um, the first meal. That is very easy to see, but with brands, it's like they just don't recall it. Why? Because it wasn't relevant. Um, and our tendency is like, oh, they didn't see it enough times. They need yeah. to see it more times. And um, they need to like, and if we show them more times this brand, That's maybe the they will recall it. That is not always a solution. You can actually increase rec recall rate significantly. Then you have the fraud as well. The fraud rolls in with, all right, we need to show as many. So all right, where do I show? Hidden behind banners or hidden behind something? Oh, I showed it. But there's a whole world of, there's a whole rabbit hole to go down under for that. Okay. Like fraud is, I'm that, not going to necessarily go at all fraud prevention <laughs> solution, but even let's see that people do see it. Like it's on the screen. We already yeah. said that people are blind to it. So if that's because it's on the screen, it's viewable. And let's, everything is correct. There's no fraud. A very utopian world I'm depicting here. There's no fraud. Um, <laughs> however, even if there's no fraud at all. Even then. People will just not notice it because they're programmed not to because yeah. they need to consume so much information they can afford to, yeah. unless it's, they, need, they actually need that information. And as we said, when I'm hungry, my brain literally, um, the way it works in psychology is I will be programmatically um, geared to search for information regarding what I'm needing. So I, I will search subconsciously for food and I will notice it a lot more. Um, same for anything else. So like if it's really hot and people are suddenly have an increased interest in ice cream just like it's normal like obviously that's obviously it's just very normal because we are automatically oh there's ice cream everywhere 
sometimes it's true there's more advertisement of that but sometimes you just notice it more like does it happen to you like i don't know if you've noticed it when it happens to you that it suddenly you notice there's like burger ads everywhere what happens of course, um of course yeah it's suddenly when you're hungrier it's like, like it's everywhere <laughs> And that is exactly that, like that logic or why we, why that happens. Um, but out of here, we have here. like a few honorable mentions. I don't know if you want to do a few honorable mentions here. No, I mean, if you talk about the, you know, we talk about SSPs being the, you have in mobile Pubmatic, Verve, that's on the SSP side, who are looking at contextual targeting and, you know, uh, MobX. If the in-play players being frame play, bid stack, add mo admix, then we're world. looking there so for them yeah it's more like really the brand, the brand, right brand has, for the right people exactly. especially important in gaming where gaming is often misunderstood yep and then you have the world of audio in gaming where that interesting crossover is happening and audio mob to odeo and then you have the world of audio of course then you have the globals the daxes triton tonos sca and then on the left hand side you have dynamic creative so it's a very interesting spectrum of one is pure advertising to dynamic creative and how they're each leveraging mobile context to basically deliver more memorable experiences for the users. And why is it important to each of these players? Yeah. And what can they do with it? Because obviously when people are, when you're focusing more on brand advertising, your use will be very different if you're doing most performance. Um, the mm -hmm. same logic, the same concept, but the use will be very different. Um, mm -hmm. Why it's so important in gaming in general and how much more adapt audio is to the use of, of context and MobX in general, just because of the tradition um, of MobX and context in radio. Cool. How much time do we have today? I, uh, we are at 47 minutes. So takeaways and questions. Go for it, takeaways. MobX is key to attract advertiser buzz it. Well, we know context is, we've defined MobX, so <laughs> yes. So indeed, MobX is key. Um, also for you advertisers, I would recommend to just stay with, um, to really think of it and to think of when and where and how people engage, just because you obviously you're spending money for, for a reason. Um, so it might as well be useful. Um, first party data is a publisher's best friend. Um, so as much as we said, don't do big data. Don't just collect everything. You still need some data. You still need to know stuff. Um, it's your just own, this is, yeah, as a publisher, this is your own user data. You don't need other other people's user data. <laughs> First, use your own user's data to deliver them something relevant. And there's enough value in that because Mobix is interesting in, that, in the sense that every user that's using your application, you can reach them differently based on what they're doing. Indeed. Every user. And that kind of links also to the equal value exchange. It's basically saying in the beginning, like, I don't want to give you my grandmother's mating time for, to get some sort of an ad recommendation. Um, use, like, only ask for enough information to give me something of equal value. Um, mm -hmm. Because that is this basically best UX. This is a good user experience. Um, so there's always have to be an equal value exchange. And finally, um, Design as if you're the user. So I don't know for the number eight um, origin story. So number eight was created because Abby wanted um, to have their, his phone understanding what song to play while it was in the gym. Um, we designed number eight um, and Abby designed number eight to basically as if we are the users. Um, and we would recommend for anyone to do that, like would do the same. If you design a solution that you want to use, that is something that you would stand behind, that you as a user will enjoy, it's probably gonna be probably gonna be right. It has um, driven quite a, a lot of our decisions over the years in terms of what we decided to go, what we decided to bet on. So that's yeah, so I think how, it's a very, very important one, very important point. And that and ties in a whole bunch of things to receptiveness to identity, to privacy, to personalization, to all the things and understanding that piece. So yeah. Exactly. Cool. And that's it. Thank you for joining us. If you want to email either Abby or myself, please feel free. Um, you have our emails. You can ask us all fun questions or just boring questions. Those are okay too. Cool. Great, thank you.
Thank you so much to the both of you. That was, I'm blown away. That was a very interesting discussion. And thank you for walking us through, you know, the origin of context and advertising, how it all started back in the good old days when we were, well, with our big desktops and heavy um, laptops and whatnot, um, and how um, it had to be pivoted into mobile. Uh, so we're talking about that agility. Um, that was really interesting. Thank you for 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 talking about that. Um, and and you know, um, Emma, I really liked your point when you um, talked about our generation and how we may be seen as lazy. Um, you're right. We're not. We're just consuming so much information all the time. And Abby, to your earlier point, was carrying these um, devices in our pockets um, all the time. We are literally connected to the web all time, every time, all day, any point in time. We are obsessively scrolling, like we can sit still and just not look at something. Like you have a minute, you're going to look at something up. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I've seen on the tube, and if you're just watching the, on the subway over here in London, sometimes just seeing what people are doing on their phones, they'll, um, I'm sure I, I've done this at some point in time as well, take my phone out, unlock it, and then look back and put it back in the phone. Wait, what did I just do? Yes, exactly. It's it's uh, it's almost like that uh, impulsive obsession. I, I was just gonna say that you took the words out of my mouth. Exactly. Yes. So, and to that point, exactly. This is where uh, Mobex is really important. Is you can't just be serving um, ads and and content to a user based on who they are. It's really important what they're doing in that moment and where they're going and and how that can be really relevant to them. So. Emma, to your point, so they can actually remember that brand, right? So um, great, thank you. Um, definitely, uh, you left us with, with a lot of things to think about. Um, in terms of questions, well, I we had those two questions that um, I believe we you just answered earlier. So thank you for that as well. Um, I, I have, I had one question as I was um, listening to some of the um, content that you were going over. So um, I believe there was something that was mentioned in terms of demos that, you know, we always, uh, at marketers, advertisers, we are trying to know who that person is and it's strictly mm -hmm. about demographics. Um, but to your point, demos are not the only metrics that we should be looking at. So in the Mobex environment, what would you say be the, the top two or top three other metrics that may be more valuable? So Mobex is all about what people are doing, right? Your physical environment or your environment, um, whether you're currently working or relaxing at home, commuting and so on. So it's more of the richness of knowledge and especially the one that will impact how receptive you are um, to that specific content. So it's not necessarily you need to know one thing for, um, for everything, but it's more like for this type of content, this is what you need to look at because this will um, really change um, the way that people will engage or not engage with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same with behavior. So if we're looking at content, um, if we're looking at um, context or MobX rather, um, that will also translate to their behavior because if you know their environment and patterns, you also know behavior over time. Um, and that will also feed into what you need to look at. But I would then say that if we look at demographic and the most horrible stories, and we actually did research about it. So what do people don't like to be targeted based on? Women, for example, and also an example from my own life, in your late 20s, early 30s, you keep getting targeted to either getting married and having babies. I was like, okay, I feel very judged right now. I feel very like, are you telling me something, universe? Because like, why are you judging my life choices? I have just a dog, just so we're clear. Um, I feel personally very judged. And that actually was a sentiment we got from a lot of users we don't want to be targeted or classified in that one box or you're a woman of this age. Therefore, you must be this. Mm -hmm. However, you're a jogger. You must want joggers, like jogging shoes. That is not, an, like there is no impact there. Um, there is no emotional thing. In fact, people statistically prefer to be targeted based on their behavior because they feel more special. Um, 
so that is a research from another university. And um, when they said that if they showed something to users and they said, based on your behavior, it looks like you might be interested in this special thing. It's like, oh, I feel so special. I feel so unique. You know me so well. Um, now, if that, like, even sometimes it will impact their behavior to a degree. So that's how much more, it's more powerful than just like, oh, you're a man, therefore you must want to look at dating apps. Mm -hmm. Um, because that feels more of a judgment. point where we have this in one of our product decks actually is like, you know, if you think of you are what, you, not what you, you know, you're not what you say you do, you are what you do. So, you know, if you think of the whole, you know, it's all adage of, uh, you know, actions speak louder than words. One is me saying, oh yeah, I like this, but then one is me actually doing it. Way more powerful. Exactly. That's where yes. real world behavior really comes in to say, you know what? Yes, that is more reliable. And that makes the individual feel more connected as well. You can also have unique, uh, you know, interesting use cases of it. So for example, if someone's, uh, we had this when we were talking with the media agency, in terms of if you see someone's a fitness enthusiast as an audience that comes up, you can introduce them to tower. You know what? You've been working on your very, avid, you know, your an avid fitness enthusiast, would you like to have a cheat meal? It's, it's so possible. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but then we would even say, do that on their, the day that they did not just come back from the gym, yeah. because if they just come back from the gym, they're not doing their cheat day. Yeah, exactly. they definitely do it on their day off. Um, so, and then like, maybe like, maybe it's time for a cheat day. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that is, that's very, that, oh, sorry. Did I mean no, please. To? Uh, no, I was just uh, going to mention that we're actually about two minutes away, um, so I don't want to. Um, I want to make sure that we we go through um, all all of this val uh, valuable information. Rather, um, thank you. No, this is this is great discussion. This is great information. So so educational. Um, again, I cannot thank you enough. Um, unless there's something else that you wanted to add to your uh, closing remarks. Thank you both to uh, IAB Canada, Polini yourself for hosting and moderating and to uh, anyone else watching uh, and hopefully it'll be useful. And again, this is this education piece is something we're beginning on and investing in right now because there is a lot of confusion in the market, especially in trying to understand and decipher what is this thing. So hopefully this is a start in something that we is something positive in terms of actually resulting in change in terms of advertiser uh, interest and advertiser knowledge as well and also practices in the industry in the ad tech space on what are the best data practices and how we actually take care of consumer privacy while delivering value to them so yeah thank you absolutely thank you so much paulina thank you so much ib canada and um, if you're confused apparently you're not alone um, and if you're not confused you're ahead of the curve so you're like you're like this just winning like we're you're winning <laughs> you're winning you got it yes you can't be wrong and this is i always say this at the end of um, almost every webinar but this is another uh great discussion that proves the point this is such an exciting time to be in this industry and uh yes looking forward to to all this uh new involvement and information so uh, one more time, thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Um, this concludes our webinar today. And in fact, it actually concludes our 2021 Community Uninterrupted Series. So thank we you. finished it with a bang. Thank you. All thank right, you, thank number you. eight. Happy All holidays, right. everyone. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.